What's up? And so, I'm the recovery pastor here at Community of Hope Church, and I'm super excited to be here with you tonight. Um, we're going to continue in our sermon series, Our Side of the Street. And so, Our Side of the Street has focused um, a lot on Romans 12, verse 18. And Romans 12, verse 18 says, If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And then we've also been um, taking a look at steps eight and nine. And so tonight we're going to take a little bit more of a look at step nine. Step nine says, Made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. And I really want to pay attention to that one part of the phrase that says direct amends. Now, direct amends implies that we are going to have a confrontation with somebody. (laughs) This isn't like um, something that's just going to kind of passively happen. This is something that we are going to have to do, um, you know, a lot of times face to face. As the big book says, eyeball to eyeball. Um, And... A lot of times this could be intimidating, this could be scary, this could be something um, I think a lot of um, people don't really want to follow through with steps eight and nine simply because they are anticipating what that conflict is going to be like and they have a negative assumption about it. And so tonight my hope is that we're going to realize that we don't have to be worried, we don't have to be scared about having confrontation, having a conflict with somebody else. Um... Because as much as I know, I've had a lot of conflict in my life. Has anybody else in here ever had a conflict in your life? Please, by a show of hands, let's see if this is a program of honesty tonight. Yes, everybody has had conflict in their life. Everybody. And if I asked who hasn't had conflict in their life and somebody raised their hand, um, you know, we would be having a further discussion because they are living in an unreality. The idea is that conflict is something that's common. And so, I want to take a look at what an author, Ken Sand, says. Um, He says in his book, The Peacemaker, conflict is a difference in opinion or purpose that frustrates someone's goals or desires. And, I mean, if you think about what that says, you know, to frustrate somebody's goals or desires simply because of a difference of opinion or purpose, I mean, that's so wide range, it's going to happen. We are created by God and we are unique in our creation. We have unique personalities. We have unique purposes. We have unique skills. We have a unique presence in life. And so something that I am pursuing is going to be different than what you may be pursuing. And so an uh, uh, obvious example is I am pursuing recovery. So I am wanting to stay sober. <laughs> I'm not drinking. I'm not smoking. And so that's part of my purpose. I want to do that so that I can provide for my family. I can be there for my wife. I can be there for my children. But somebody else may just want to go out and have some fun. And the way they define that is by getting some beers, going out, having some shots, smoking a little bit of weed. What's the big deal? And so automatically we are in conflict with one another because we are pursuing something different and yet we are still rubbing shoulders. So the idea is that we are going to be having conflict with people throughout um, our life. Um, And another way it's said is um, by a a previous professor of mine. I actually just finished his class officially yesterday, but I finished my final exam on (laughs) Thursday, and that was super exciting for me. I am no longer in conflict with that professor. Um, (laughs) um, But the way he describes it, his name is uh, Dr. Mike Griffin. And he says, conflict is a normal aspect of human interaction that often arises from unmet needs, unrecognized differences, and difficulties coping with life changes. And again, we're all going to have different needs. We all have different expectations. We all adjust to the changing um, circumstances and situations in life differently than other people. And so we're going to find ourselves in conflict, some of them varying in degree, right? You know, a conflict with somebody that is still in um, pursuit of recovery is going to be very different than, say, maybe a a theological argument like um, Pastor Jeff shared that he had with somebody in his past. And so 
Um, there's varying degrees, but it's going to be common. And so I just want us to go into this teaching recognizing that we don't have to be scared of conflict because it's going to happen. The idea is that there's going to be different degrees of it. There's going to be different situations, circumstances, but we have the ability to pursue it because it's just an aspect of life, as um, Dr. Griffin shares. Um, and so when I was thinking about what conflict was and how it applied and all of the different things, I really um, kept on being brought back to this um, scripture, and it's James 1, verse 19. Let me open up to that. We have James 1, verse 19. It says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Let me pray. God, thank you so much for tonight. God, thank you for the recovery that we find here. Thank you for the community that we find here. As that we are all pursuing a very similar um, goal. God, we ask that um, tonight that you speak to every single person here in a unique way that would give them confidence as they per, um, pursue recovery, that, that would give them confidence as they interact with other people and have um, conflict, and that they would be able to manage it um, with love, um, patience, and um, they would have love, God, that they would have patience, and that they would see that just because we're different, doesn't mean we have to hate each other. God, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the book of James. Um, the book of James was written by James, that's right. And so sometimes in the Bible, the book is um, named by the person who wrote it, and sometimes it's written um, or it's uh, named after the person that it was written to. And so we can see like First and Second Timothy. That wasn't written by Timothy. That was written by the Apostle Paul um, to a man named Timothy who was a church leader. He was a young guy. And he was doing his best to make sure that people found the love of Christ. Um, but this was written by James. He was the half-brother of Jesus. And um, we say half-brother because we recognize that Jesus was um, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit with Mary um, and James was his brother. So they were growing up together, but James had a different dad. His, his dad wasn't God like Jesus's was. His dad was Joseph, who was the husband of Mary. And so what's interesting about, about James was that he didn't believe that Jesus was God. This is kind of unique. You know, this is the Bible. That's what's supposed to be happening in here. Um, but he didn't believe that Jesus was God until his death and resurrection, but after his death and resurrection, after Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, James become, became one of the biggest followers. He became a church leader. He, he was a part of all sorts of stuff in the beginning of Christianity. In fact, he ended up writing a book that you and I get to read from now in the Bible. And it's something that's really powerful because the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is why we have hope in Jesus. In fact, the Apostle Paul says, if it's not for the resurrection of Jesus, then we're all just a whole bunch of suckers, you know? We are to be pitied the most. The idea is that when Jesus came back to life, and it wasn't in spirit form, it was in the flesh after being dead for three days. You're not like kind of dead after three days. You're dead dead. And when he came back, James devoted his life to his his half-brother, Jesus Christ. And he became a big church follower or a big church leader. And we get to read the um, information that he believed and that he pursued throughout his life that he was persecuted for um, in, in our scripture. And the book was written to a group of um, Jewish men and women. And this is significant because these weren't Jewish men and women that were like in their home city. These were Jewish men and women that are called diaspora, and that means that they were scattered away from Jerusalem. And now you're, I can, I can just hear the thoughts like, what does that matter to my recovery right now? <laughs> because, you know, we're, we're finding out about a group of people who used to be Jewish but started to believe in Jesus as their Lord and Messiah after he um, was crucified and resurrected from the dead, and they didn't live in like their hometown, big deal. But what's significant about this is that 
because they lived outside of Jerusalem, they were always in tension with people. They had a strong Jewish belief, monotheism. They believed in one true God. But a lot of the cultures that they were surrounded by, they were um, people called Gentiles, and Gentiles were simply just non-Jewish people. And so they were Gentiles that had all sorts of beliefs. They believed in multiple um, gods. They believed that you could do all sorts of things that conflicted with Jewish people. And so James, being a Jewish person that was born and raised a Jew, is writing to these people who are now Christians, who are suffering persecution for their beliefs, not only because they were Jewish, but now because they believe in Jesus, and not only because they were Jewish and now believe in Jesus, and surrounded by a whole bunch of people that have differing uh, uh, theologies than them, but now because they're also mingling with the people that they never mingled with before. You feel the tension a little bit? It's the idea that they, they used to look down on Gentiles. It, it, uh, something that was really big in Jewish custom was that they wanted to be clean. They needed to be clean. And so they had all these rituals to make themselves clean. And because the Gentiles didn't follow any of it, they were filthy people. They were dirty in the Jewish people's eyes. And now because they're sharing a common belief outside of the Jewish tradition, but founded in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, they are starting to come together. And even though they have this um, similar belief, this idea that Jesus died and rose from the dead, the Jewish customs were still prevalent to all the Jewish people who had converted to Christianity. And the Gentile customs were still prevalent to all the people who just committed their life to Christianity. And so they're in this constant tension with one another as they try to live and believe and worship next to one another. And I think that is why, listening to this scripture tonight, James 1.19, he says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. He's not saying this that it would just be generally a good thing. He's saying this because there's constant tension because of conflict happening within the church that they are building. And I know for me, thinking about what it is um, before I got released to come home, I had this tension about myself that I was going to be a foreigner in an outside land even though this was my hometown. Because I knew all of the dealers, I knew all the bars, and it was just natural for me to go to them. But I had to live in a tension as I pursued what I knew to be right, which was recovery. And I had to live in this tension as I'm a very, um, I, I don't share the common belief with a lot of people in our culture. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of an outsider. Here, this, you guys are my people. (laughs) But at the same time, I was in constant tension within myself and within the people around me because I was pursuing something that was different than what they were. And so as he's saying this, he's speaking to me in a personal way, and that's why I love to read scripture. And if you don't normally do it, I challenge you tonight, go home, open the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we'll give one to you. Start in Matthew, start in John, and ask a lot of questions. And so with all of this stuff on our mind. Tonight's title is called Pursuing Peace in Conflict. So as we are taking care of our side of the street in an effort to live at peace with everyone, it is not our job to avoid everyone because we, now can, because we can now see that conflict is inevitable. We're not just going to become hermits. We have to continue to live life on life's terms. That's why I love recovery because that's the tools of recovery give us the ability to do it. And so instead, it is up to, do, up, up to us to do our part to pursue peace while we are in conflict, simply just because of the nature of life. And I know you've heard me say it before, that I like to do things in my life that reflect my act of recovery. As it is, when I was not in my act of recovery, I was in my act of addiction, and a lot of the things that were happening in my life would reflect the act of addiction that I was in. I was drunk a lot. I was high a lot. 
I avoided people. I, I actually, at one point in time, I developed this like phobia where I couldn't answer my phone. I couldn't get rid of it because I still had to call my drug dealer, but I wasn't able to answer my phone because I was scared that it was going to be a bill collector. I was scared that it was going to be somebody that I had just wronged and they were calling from somebody else's phone number because I would screen all of their calls. I had to keep my phone, but I couldn't answer it. So now in my act of recovery, I want to be able to pursue peace. I don't want to have to avoid phone calls. I don't want to have to avoid people. I want to be able to live at peace with everybody as much as it does depend on myself. And so this means that I like to be at peace with people. This means that I like to compliment people instead of tearing them down like I used to. I like to introduce people into a better way of life, a life of Christianity, a life of recovery, because I used to introduce people into a life of selfishness, into a life of crime and drugs. Another way I can say this is that I actively pursue the presence of God's grace in my life by the way I carry out my recovery in all of my relationships and my activities. Now, I don't pretend to be perfect, um, but it's a pursuit. The idea that I'm constantly correcting myself if I find myself veering out of that course. And so James is instructing us in a way that wisdom can be revealed when we are interacting with one another. First, he says, be quick to. He says, be quick to. Now, what I see him saying here is that when wisdom is the goal, listening is the first priority. Because he says, be quick to listen. Has anyone here ever been cut off by a person when you are speaking? Yeah. It's pretty lame, right? <laughs> it doesn't just mend a problem. It doesn't create a solution. The idea is that you become offended. No, I was saying something, and when I speak, it represents thoughts, and my thoughts represent my beliefs, and my beliefs represent who I am. And so if you're cutting me off, by default, you're not really interested in who I am. And I can go very deep with that really quick, and I have to learn to assume the best, and so I'm still working on it. Um, but, you know, anything that person says afterwards is basically null and void, because the response they are giving you is a response to an incomplete thought. So basically what James is saying is hurry up and shut up. Just be quiet. Let the other person talk and let them explain the point of view that they're having. Because when we listen, we respect and we validate the other person. And as it is, when we are quick to listen, we are acknowledging that what the other person has to say is valuable information. Also that you are validating what the other person's feelings and point of view are. And then we can look to the second instruction by James and see that it builds on the first one. Now he begins by saying, be slow to. And so as we're reading scripture, as, as like I said, I really encourage you guys to go home and open up your Bible. As you're reading, don't do it to have a checkbox do it and engage with it. And so he's starting to give three commands. The first is saying, be quick to. The second one draws a contrast. Why is he contrasting himself? The first one, he's trying to impart this positive affirmation of what wisdom can be applied, how it can be applied. Now he's saying what to avoid. He says, be slow to speak. Now he doesn't mean like, speak slowly when you're talking to somebody. No, he's saying, Listen, and then respond with intentionality. Because I know when I'm in conflict, it becomes super easy as my beliefs are starting to be um, challenged, as my thoughts are being challenged, as the way that I'm pursuing life is being challenged. It can be very easy for me to respond really quickly and just defend myself and defend my stance and let them know why they're wrong and all of the different levels. That's not what I meant to say. But instead, be intentional. Think about what we're going to say so that we can move forward in a way that isn't going to create a further offense. And so think about this. When we are in conflict with someone, our ideas, our beliefs, our intellect, and our point of views are being challenged. That does not really sit well with people. 
And that's why it's so easy to take negative stances against people when we find ourselves differing on any given subject. But what I believe he's saying is basically people say things they wish they hadn't when they are quick to speak because they are being slow to listen. Have you ever seen a Facebook conflict? (laughs) <laughs> like, how fast are people when it comes to reaction? I feel like people that normally, that are like me, type maybe like 10 words a minute. All of a sudden, they can type like 50 words a minute. And it's like the best they've ever typed is all of a sudden being put out in the worst way. Even though I've seen family that have been at family reunions together go toe-to-toe with each other on Facebook. They're probably reading a piece of what the other person is saying and then just reacting. The idea is that we're not going to react. We're going to respond. But that takes intentionality. That takes the idea that I'm going to listen to what you said, assume the best, and respond in a way that's going to represent my beliefs, not in a misguided understanding of yours. That's why it's so important to pay attention to our side of the street. And so we can see this reiterated in Ephesians 4, verse 29. The Apostle Paul says, Do not let anyone, any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. I wonder how many conflicts could just be squashed if we were to just try to do our best, intentionally respond in a way that's going to build the other person up. Instead of responding in kind, because it's so easy to do that, right? If you feel you're being attacked, then you have to take the attack back. And all of a sudden, you find yourselves just going toe-to-toe for no reason. I know I've personally found myself where I'm like, I don't remember why I was so upset with my wife. (laughs) I just... I remember that I was offended and I remember that I responded in a way that I regretted and I responded in a way that created distance between us. But what was it that was so offensive? The idea for me is that as I'm pursuing my active recovery, I want to be able to show it by the way that I interact with people. And the way that I can do that is by responding instead of reacting. I can do that by building others up instead of breaking them down. I can do that by being confident in who I am and standing firm in my beliefs and not retaliating in kind to what their actions or words are against me. The idea is that we want to build people up. It is this kind of language that requires listening first and intentional response according to what was spoken. And so think about this. As many of us here have been in navigating our faith and recovery, which means we are looking for a way to embrace and implement our faith and recovery in our lives, we have opened up our souls to people, especially if we have gone through steps four and five. We open up to people, and we're telling them some of the worst things that we've done. We're telling them some of the worst things that have happened to us. We're looking at resentments that have festered inside of our souls for so long and we're finally giving voice and a name to them. I remember my sponsor sat there and he listened to me. It was so refreshing. Something that I felt was going to actually suck the life out of me actually gave me life because after I completely finished, he would respond And he intentionally spoke words that would build me up instead of seeing the hurts that I'd suffered and using those to tear me down. And that's why steps four and five are so great and I believe that's why steps eight and nine are so powerful because we have the ability not only to learn what um, love is like in steps four and five, but we learn how to express it and reciprocate it in steps eight and nine. And so finally, James says, be slow to anger. This part is also built on the instruction before it. And by being slow to speak, we fight against anger manifesting itself 
through our words and our actions. And I know that in my recovery, my anger and my resentment, or excuse me, in my addiction, my anger and my resentment manifested itself in all aspects of my life. I remember I told you, I think last week, I told you I was resentful to the banks. (laughs) I didn't have any real reason, but it was a convenient excuse for me to go and take money from them. The idea was I would live inside of a mentality that was geared towards anger and resentment. I, was, I didn't know how to be slow to anger. If I heard something that was just a little sideways from what my belief was, I immediately retaliated and was offended at the idea that that even existed. Can anybody, like, relate to that? The idea that if somebody spoke something against something that I believed, I felt that they were attacking me personally, that all of a sudden that I had to take a stance against their attack that I perceived, and they were probably just saying something. You know, like on Facebook, you could probably find a long discussion of how hateful people can be if somebody says Coca-Cola is better than Pepsi. You know, (laughs) like, oh my gosh, don't get me started because Coca-Cola is just so much better. Um, But in all reality, the idea is that we could be offended super quick and super easy if we let ourselves because it's a natural stance. But that's why recovery, we have to do things that represent our active recovery. And the way we navigate conflict is going to be a big, big part of that. And so, excuse me for a moment. I can realize now that I was creating distance when I reacted in anger and out of my resentment. I was creating distance from a solution, and therefore I was creating distance from the people I was in relationships with because I would just lash out and I would get loud, or I would just get really cold. I don't care. That doesn't matter to me. Sure, whatever. I do, whatever. And I'm just, I don't want to engage with that person anymore. I'm not going to raise my voice and get super loud and angry because I know that that's bad, but instead uh, my anger is going to show up in a way that I'm just going to be cold and distant. Instead of doing what our scripture is showing us that we need to do, doing what steps eight and nine are designed to do, which is living at peace with everybody. It's a tall order, but if we focus on ourselves, then it becomes doable because we only have to focus on one interaction at a time. So we can see that this scripture, James 119, is very complementary to our theme verse of Romans 1218, which says, If it is possible, As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, this is an approach that results in peace among people that we can employ when we are in conflict with others so that we may have peace in our lives, which will reflect your active recovery through your faith in your life. And so I've created some take-homes tonight. Um... I've uh, listened to our pastor Trevor and a training he did for our, um, the employees of the church um, recently and through my study, and I, I came up with these three things, or these four things, um, that I think are going to be very, very helpful, and I know that they have been very helpful for me, and it's exactly what we've been talking about tonight. And so one, when we are in conflict with someone, Be quiet and listen until the other person has finished. This is going to force us to be intentional in our response. And when they have finished, number two, in the first 30 seconds, state your mutual purpose. Something like, I care about this too. Because when we find ourselves at odds with somebody else, we feel that they don't care about what we care about. And if they don't care about what we care about, then all of a sudden we can find ourselves needing to be against them. So we focus on what our purpose is and what our side of the street says, and it's, I care about this too. And the second one is state mutual respect. I care about you. We're trying to live at peace with everybody. In order to do that, we have to actually care about them. I care about you. And I care about what you're talking about. Let's move forward together in this point. Not you need to understand why I'm right. And number three, 
Remove the always and never from your language. You always do this. I can't stand it. And every time I do this, you never acknowledge me. You never understand where I'm coming from. How come you always overlook my opinions? You always interject. You never actually listen. When we're doing that, we're stating uh, something about somebody's entirety (laughs) and always and never. People can change. Please let me know that people can change. I once was actively addicted to heroin. Now I'm not. This is a very good situation. I have changed. The person that you're in conflict can change too. Remove always and never from your language. And the fourth one, if you find yourself getting angry, call a time out. That's not something just for a kid to go into a corner. <laughs> no, call a time out and say, hey, I can't continue to talk about this right now because I'm so angry. Let me come back to you in two hours. I am so upset about this right now. I don't know exactly what I'm going to say. Let's talk about this in the morning. Create a time for you and the person that's in conflict to re-engage with this. This will give you time to think about what was said. This will give you time to think about how you can respond in a way that's going to build them up. And this will be good because it'll give you time to call your sponsor. (laughs) It'll give you time to call your accountability if your sponsor doesn't answer. It'll give you time to pray. It'll give you time to assume the best about the other person. And so then when you guys reconvene, start again with number one. And so guys, tonight we're talking about conflict. It's something that's going to happen in our life. And when I think about something that's going to happen that we don't want to happen, it's kind of like, thinking that you're not going to get in fight as you walk into a boxing ring. You're going to get knocked out. You have to learn how to adjust. You have to learn how to handle the situation. Know that it's coming, and you'll be able to deal with it accordingly instead of getting getting caught off guard and then reacting. And so, God, thank you so much for tonight. Lord, I pray that people will find encouragement in your word, that people will find encouragement in their meetings tonight, and that they will connect with one another and that they will learn how to navigate conflict in a way that represents their recovery, in a way that represents their faith. God, I love you and I thank you. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for letting me share.